My name is Bond. James Bond. James Bond. What do you know about an uncle Scaramanga, the boy said? The man with the golden gun. Bonjour, Monsieur Bond. You is ugly. Hey, man, good night. We got you spotted. Oh, a surprise. British secret agent James Bond 007 is marked for death by the world's greatest assassin, Francisco Scaramanga. James Bond follows his only lead to a cabaret dancer who keeps one of Scaramanga's golden bullets as a good luck charm. James Bond retrieves the charm in a most unusual way, and Bond brings the bullet to Q Branch, who connect the ballistics back to a highly skilled bullet maker named Lazar. Lazar has a special order of golden bullets, which Bond tracks to intermediary Ms. Anders. With the help of Bond's secretary, Mary Goodnight, Bond tracks Ms. Anders to the Peninsula Hotel. Bond interrogates Ms. Anders and convinces her to join forces. Bond follows a lead to the Bottoms Up Club, where he becomes up close and personal with one of Scaramanga's assassinations. Bond is brought in by Hong Kong police, who turns out to be Bond's contact, and brings him to MI6 headquarters for a meeting with HQ. With the help of an unlikely Q gadget, Bond infiltrates the headquarters of High Fat who believes Bond to be Scaramanga. But the real Scaramanga is one step ahead of James Bond. James Bond returns to the home of High Fat and gets an unwelcome reception and is knocked out cold by Scaramanga's henchman, Nick Knack. Bond wakes up to find more than he can handle at a karate dojo, but makes a swift escape and gets some unlikely help. Bond proceeds to make a waterborne escape and Scaramanga changes terms with High Fat. James Bond has a romantic evening with Mary Goodnight, but her evening is interrupted when Ms. Anders pays James Bond a visit, and the two make a plan to work together. Ms. Anders obtains the valuable Solex agitator, and James Bond prepares to meet Ms. Anders to make a trade, but unfortunately, Scaramanga got to her first. Bond still manages to retrieve the Solex agitator and pursues Scaramanga, who's taken Mary Goodnight hostage. James Bond meets up with an old friend, and the two pursue Scaramanga, who manages to make a high-flying escape. James Bond tracks down Scaramanga to his island hideout, gets a look at Scaramanga's laboratories, and is reunited with Mary Goodnight as the trio sit down to dinner. But James Bond is challenged to a showdown, and it's mano a mano. But James Bond manages to get the drop on Scaramanga, and he and Miss Goodnight have to retrieve the Solex agitator. Escaping just in time, Bond and Mary Goodnight finally get a moment to themselves before they're rudely interrupted. James Bond dispatches with the henchmen, and the two... Well, the three of them sail off into the sunset. Written by Richard Maybaum and Tom Mankiewicz and directed by Guy Hamilton, 1975's The Man with the Golden Gun. It says, uh, is it 74? 75. I think it's 74. It came out on Christmas, I believe, of 74. Yeah, it's uh, 1974. It is. It, it was. It, you know. That's why I want to bring it up because um, it's the uh, because uh, Live and Let Die is seventy three. It's the first time since Thunderball, which they did a uh, Bond movie in a consecutive year. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Written by Richard Maybaum and Tom Mankiewicz and directed by Guy Hamilton, nineteen seventy four's The Man with the Golden Gun. And by the way, I've been saying nineteen seventy five forever. I always thought there were just every other year, every odd year throughout the seventies, and you just brought it to my attention. It was seventy four. I did. That's right. Yeah. Didn't know that. Yeah, I think, like I said, I think um, from Doctor No to Thunderball, it was every year, and then they started doing mm. every other year, and then they decided to for this one. They said we went right into production. So yeah. Yeah. Interesting. All right, the man with the golden gun, and yes. I I'm gonna confess right out of the gate, this is my least watched Bond film. Okay. Like, for every other film that we've done so far, I probably could have just done it from memory, but, you know, I'll still watch it just to brush up. This one I genuinely felt like I had to watch because I hadn't <laughs> seen it in a long time. Right. Uh -huh. uh, I, I, know, I mean, again, I remember parts. I forget how they line up, whatever. So, yeah, I, I had to really sit and watch this one again. 
I, you know what? I've said that. I, I've seen this. This is one of those weird ones where I'd record. I had made an audio recording of it, you know, back in the day to listen mm. to. You know, it was like one of those rare things where, you know, this is even before VHS. So I, you know, I put the, you know, I had my little recorder and I put it up to the I TV. I do that, yeah. Put it up to the TV speaker. And I had, so I, I knew this film, you know, at least a lot of the audio. And the weird thing is, is that it was when it was the. Uh, here in America, it was the ABC Sunday Night Movie or whatever. So it mm. had like some weird cuts in it too. Um, so like it's weird when I watch the movie because like when those cutscenes come up, I was like, oh yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> that's uh, you know that's from the original <laughs> theatrical cut. Yeah. 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 But uh, I really like this movie. I, I, I like it a lot. Um, it's and it's got you know when I was watching it this time, I was uh, I was kind of thinking about it, like the first like half hour forty five minutes is really good actually. Mm. There's some really good stuff. Yeah, I would. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think it's okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, seriously, we just talked about uh, live and let die, and honestly, I said there that I feel like the stakes never really hit, uh, like a crescendo, or whatever. Right. Uh, it, it, you never really reach a certain height. Um, this one, even more so. I feel like this one is very lukewarm, and again, it, it is frustrating because I there's so many aspects of it that I like the idea of Bond James Bond going against like head to head against like the world's greatest assassin Christopher Lee played by Christopher Lee yeah, no yeah, yeah. Christopher Lee no less right. I mean he, I mean he is just tremendous yeah um, originally they wanted Jack Palance and he passed so um, mm. and and they had him originally he was written more as a brute um, which I guess he's more like in the novel. Yeah. But when they get Christopher Lee, they kind of decide to change that up a little bit, make him more yeah. like the um, counterpoint to James Bond. Mm. And because uh, Christopher Lee has this elegance about him that uh, I think fits the character of Scaramanga as written now in this movie perfectly. I agree. I and that is that's actually something else that I'll give this film a lot of credit for because usually I'll say, you know, stick with the Fleming books. You can't go wrong. Stick with Fleming. But honestly. I, the the novel the man with the golden gun is not one of my favorites it's a, a little weird and the character of scaramanga again it's he's not an assassin who's after james bond he's he's um his name is pistols scaramanga and he's more of a cowboy and i suppose if you might be like um a, a british youth in the 50s and all the westerns that were big then, Roy Rogers, the Lone Rangers, all that good stuff. Um, you might read about Pistol Scaramanga. I think that's pretty exotic, but you know, for us, it's kind of like yawn. Um, isn't that the last? So, isn't that wasn't that Ian Fleming's last novel as well? Yes, mm -hmm. and it was published posthumously. So the theory is that he probably never even got around to doing a second or third draft to right. it. Mm -hmm. It's a little rough. It's you know, it's a little rough for Fleming. Um, with that said, I think the film feels much more like a James Bond adventure than the novel does. Uh, so I think in that respect, the film is much more exotic. The, the the villain is much more exotic. And I think it really works. So there's a lot about the film I really like. Actually, it's uh, interesting in the writing because um, I think McKenzie did a, did a draft. And then they brought in Maybaum to, re, you know, to do a draft. And he came up mm. with that whole Solex agitator stuff. And then... Um, um, McKenzie came back and did the final draft that they they shot. Mm. Right. See, and that's it's interesting too. It, uh, so there in, is sort of my theory about how I think even they probably felt like this doesn't really hit the big grand heights of of some of the Bond movies of the past. So in fact, I used to joke about how like before they got the rights to Casino Royale back, I used to sort of say like, yeah, they could they could do the novel. Again, but they'll probably throw in like a big giant satellite, mm. laser right. satellite that's gonna blow up the world or whatever. Uh, they wouldn't let the whole thing be the be the story as it's written. And then, of course, fast forward to today, I guess times change and people were kind of ready for it again. So uh, they did. Again, here you needed the big old giant laser to again sort of show some sort of stakes. I think, but even then, it doesn't really do much. It doesn't really add much to I it. I think that. Uh I mean, it, that's sort of like a MacGuffin and, and, and really a subplot. Um, yes. I really like the beginning of this where, um, you know, I, I like the Scaramanga Funhouse stuff and then Mark Lawrence Returns is very much like the gangster type as he was in Diamonds Are Forever. Yes. yes. Um, I kind of wondered, though, if I was when I was watching, and he does a fine job, Mark Lawrence, for what, you know, he's, he's been told to play mm -hmm. this type of gangster and he's done it many times and he's great at it. Sure. Um, but I was wondering, 
Wouldn't it be great if they did it like sort of like a James Bond type, you know, like let's say like like um, let's say like there's a George Lazenby type. He's kind of like a Bondish kind of character and he goes in there, but then gets defeated by Scaramanga. I don't know. Maybe that would have raised mm. the stakes a little bit to like oh, you know, yeah. Scaramanga's skill and so forth. But it's fine. It's yeah, fine yeah. as it is. I've also heard people kind of theorize as to whether or not he's supposed to be the same. Yeah, character. I don't know. I, uh, they actually give I, a I name. Like I, think I, I don't think know. His character's name is Rodney, although I don't think it's ever mentioned in the film itself. Oh, yeah. is that right? Okay. Yeah. I don't know what his character is uh, in Diamonds Are Forever. But. Yeah. And and by the way, this is another another time where there's no James Bond in the free titles. Right. Yeah, kind of a swing <laughs> in the miss. I, I get that you're trying to prop up the villain. Man, they're build, they're, you know, and show they're us building that. up to that great ski jump. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. So, so, yeah, again, I you know, like we'll, we'll dive deep. But I, I, for me, this film, it never really takes off, you know. Um, it It's... It's fine. It's it's fine, but boy, is it just kind of, it's tepid. It is just very tepid for me. I think you know, like you this, know, like we're talking about the beginning, like the Scaramanga Funhouse. I wish that was a little better, you know, as far as its design and so forth. It's yeah. okay, um, but I, I wanted a little more from his Funhouse. You know, yeah. Um, I wish it was a little more elaborate. But that being said, I guess it is what it is, and uh, you got Christopher mm. Lee in there, and Christopher Lee does wonders, I think, with this film as far as elevating it yeah. to a level. Yeah, he. I mean, I would probably have to say that Christopher Lee as Scaramanga has to be one of the best Bond villains. Yes, uh, I, I, at least I, up there in the top. It's an easy sell for me. I'm a big Christopher Lee fan. Um, I I mm. got this um back in the day, or well, it was about ten years ago, maybe even fifteen now. But I bought this um set. And I decided to get back into Hammer Horror Films, which I which I really love. I really discovered this whole other, you know, British film side of British film, you know, mm. other than James Bond, that it was I thought was terrific. Um, but in it, they had this extra documentary for the Scars of Dracula DVD called "The Many Faces of Christopher Lee," and it basically was him mm. just sitting down talking about some of the roles he played in his career, uh, like Scaramanga, um, Fu Manchu, Dracula, of course. Mm. And it was really just a cool documentary because he even like sings like some opera in it, and he did like a heavy metal album at one point when he was like in his you know his eighties. It's amazing. The guy is yeah. so talented. Yeah, the, I mean he he has. You know, and it's almost kind of. I, I I remember reading like books about James Bond, about the James Bond franchise, and they were sort of focused on the idea that it was kind of like James Bond versus Dracula. I remember that and there's a chapter probably back then. I, I, I probably would one of the early James Bond books that I had that I you know kind of read religiously. Yeah, um, it's like I think one of the chapters is like uh, Bond. Dracula meets Bond on an island in the sun was the name of the chapter for Man with the Golden Gun. I always thought that was kind of fun. It yeah, sounds yeah, right. Yeah, it sounds you know. familiar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I And I remember thinking back then, yeah, I guess that makes sense. But of course, now that I look back, I kind of feel like that was so dismissive, you know, because <laughs> yeah, I feel like yeah. he's just such a good, oh, yeah. he, he, yes. you know what I mean? I mean, he's so good in this he role. He really is. Yeah. And incidentally, I, I've always loved the, the kind of the, the gimmick about him putting the actual gun together. Yeah, so like the gun basically is cool. he could walk yeah. around, always have the gun on him. No yeah. one would know better because it's a pen and a lighter, etc. And then he puts it together. I mean, that I thought that's very that, clever. That scene I think where that's... he's with high fat and then he's talking to him, and he's yes. like, you know, you don't know what he's doing, you know, and he's like doing this, you know, he's putting this. Yes, thing, yes. And all of a he realizes he's put this gun together. Bonjour, Monsieur Bond. I am Nick Nack. You, you got the hurry, Villachez. As knickknack, which oh, I think yeah, is yeah. kind of a neat counterpoint. I mean, um, I really love that, um, you know, that he's sort of like doing all the stuff. That, and uh, Scaramanga sort of has like sort of a gourmet taste, you know, and he's cooking all these mm. exotic lunches for him and so forth. Yes. Y- you know, it's interesting, too, because I rem- it- it- it's-, it's almost sort of funny. I look at this when I was watching it again today. I'm thinking to myself, like, I'm sort of surprised they hadn't had uh, a... Little person, midget, I guess. You can't say midget anymore, <laughs> yeah. I guess. Because, um, again, because the Bond films were always sort of fascinated with, like, physical abnormalities. So you'd think that would sort of be a given. But I guess it, it wasn't until this character actor, Hervé Villachez, was so popular. Because, again, he was Tattoo from Although Fantasy he, Island he, back he then. He didn't do that until after Golden Gun, though. So he was sort of, a, he was so, he oh, was sort right, of right. unknown at this point when this movie came out. Right, good point there. But again, seriously, like again, for a, a franchise that is sort of almost almost 
prided itself on again the fascination with these physical abnormalities. You would have th- you would have thought they would have tried that a long time ago. But here you go, and it and like you said, it works. He's he's interesting. Yeah, I, I think he's a really great henchman. I, I really like. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's your butcher thing. I've never killed a major before, but there can always be a first time. Oh, monsieur. Okay, um, let me just back up a little bit. I really love the first, at least like the first half hour of this, because I, you know after the, the titles and stuff, and then Bond finds about Scaramanga that he's on a mm-hmm. hit list, and I like the, the, the actually the storytelling in this is pretty good, and mm. uh, he finds he finds that belly dancer, the belly, yep. uh, you know, with the golden yes. gun bullet, and that's actually a pretty that's probably like the best action scene in maybe the film maybe. Because it's not really... I mean, it, yeah, well, it does It does go to a punchline, doesn't it? Ah, I've lost my charm! Not from where I'm standing. But it's not a bad fight scene. Even though they, <laughs> you know, they hit the mirror and you see the camera crew for a few seconds there. But <laughs> it's, that, This is true, I, I, this is true. I don't true. think uh, more strength was in the fisticuffs. As far as... Yeah, if I had to yeah. say he had a weak point, maybe it was in the physicality of the fights, maybe. You know, I I watched it today, and I was mildly surprised at, for Roger Moore, I kind of thought this fight scene was a tiny bit brutal. It is. There's a a shot of him clunking the guy's head into the wall or something. Uh, I did sort of notice, like, this is kind of rough for a Roger Moore Bond movie. But, yeah, I agree with you. He's always kind of had, um, the the attempts at being fluid were often clumsy. Yeah. But then, and they, but then he gets awkward. that bullet, and then they go. He he finds out the manufacturer of the bullet, uh, Lazar, right? Yes. And he goes over there, and that I think is a terrific sequence um, of him getting. Yes, you know, yes. he talks about the um, the bullet that uh, the gun that fires because it's uh, the base of the thing is made for um, somebody with three fingers a instead three fingered. of five. And yes. That is why you're one mm-hmm. inch too low. You know, <laughs> and mm-hmm. then he uses the gun on the guy. Yep, yep. That is terrific. And you know what I like about I it, too, which they kind of get away from later on, is sort of like you, Roger Moore walks in, and he's very charming and pleasant and affable, and then he's, like, really dangerous, which is something, and he's, he's mm. kind of, like, not to be, you know, he's not to be toyed with, <laughs> you know? Mm. <laughs> it's an interesting, because, again, Roger Moore hasn't quite settled right, into right. the role yet, um, and it, and and. People will sort of comment like there's a part with him, uh, Miss Anders. I think that's a great. I, that's a great scene up. because it's like the usual, you know, more fun stuff. You know, she comes out of the shower with a mm. gun and he's like a water pistol, <laughs> which is a great <laughs> little line. But then he gets really rough with her because he's like, you got to remember, he's on a hit list, or, or so he thinks. He's got to get to the bottom of it, you know, because you know, really, I don't know if the the movie really has a sense of a of a ticking clock. But, um, you know, he's going to find this guy, you know, because this guy's, you know, this successful assassin, you know, try, you know, supposedly one of the best in the business um, is that is, is, is after him. He, he can't fool around. And um, mm. I, that, that's why I think the scene is justified. I mean, even great. She's at one point she's wearing a robe. He's like grabs her, by, you know, the scruff of the neck. And like, wow, he's not fooling around here. man. Yes. Yes. Right. And right. And honestly, Truthfully, we ra- we haven't even seen Connery this rough no, since no. Doctor No. And then, frankly, uh, Maud <laughs> Adams is terrific uh, in this, by the way. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Very beautiful. And she, yes, she doesn't and get she much to do, but she makes the most of her scenes. I feel, and uh, she totally mm. sells me on what you know. This woman kind of trapped in this terrible um, involvement with Scaramanga. You know, this terrible relationship. Mm. That kind of leads us to the main Bond girl, Mary Goodnight. Now, I know a lot of people get a lot of flack for Mary Goodnight, but I have to say, once in a while, uh-huh. I like a ditz. And uh, I think she's terrific at playing a ditz. And uh, it might not mm. be what you want or what other people want. People want a stronger woman, and I totally get that. Um, and, and I mm. enjoy those uh, roles for women as too. But I say, like, people are, people are different, you know? And it's neat to have one. I, yes. You know, is it kind of believable that she would be hired by MI6? Probably not. But um, it's mm. she's fun to have along for the journey. And she's not in it a whole bunch either. Yes, she's not. And that's sort of what I found yeah. fascinating this time around. Honestly, uh, like you said, I don't mind the fact that she's a little little bit of an airhead, which is it's fine. You know, it works and, and you know, she's very likable. 
But I, I did notice watching it today, like, boy, she's, they dismiss her really weirdly. Like, she shows up, like, at, at one point, and then she's kind of gone for a long time. And I kind of felt like even Rosie Carver, frankly, had more presence in the film than than this this one does. I mean, she barely, barely feels like, doesn't really feel like she the main Bond She actually gets more girl. to do in the second half of the picture. Right, what, right. Once Maud Adams is, is taken out. Then suddenly she steps up and now she's much more involved. But but before that, like she's yeah, again, like n- not a lot of um, fanfare no. for her at all. Um, no. But then uh, you know the second half of the film, you got her in a bikini, so I'm not complaining. <laughs> no, I think I, I think she really uh, she what she was given for the role. I think she pulled it off great. You know for what the, for what was written. Okay, um, and she was mm-hmm. fine. I, yeah, I I don't have a problem with her. And like I said, once in a while, it's fun to have a dance. I mean, if you watch like a lot of these other films, like the uh, the Flint series or the Matt Helm series, that that's like a standard character is the ditzy sidekick, you know thing. It's yes. like almost in every one. Well, of that's them, a you know, you know, yeah, you know. Honestly, we're kind of. I guess this was the time when the kind of sex comedies were mm-hmm. were kind of getting big. <laughs> and even the scene in the opening of the original when they show when Bond has the Italian agent and she kind of you know does this and tiptoes across the floor I remember thinking like that's something out of almost like <laughs> Benny yeah. Hill And this one sort of ups it a little more. Like, it's interesting. Like, I, I kind of find that this one, it's a sexier film. Yes. They, there's a little more, the, the nudity is a little, like, we're kind of dancing a little too close to nudity in this. Bottoms up. Um, <laughs> just the fact that James... And then that... that the bottoms that up. Yeah. Exactly, right. I, I mean, there's, so there's right. some nudity in there. I mean, right, not, right, not real right. nudity, but for a Bond movie, this right, is right. a lot of skin. Um, and even the fact that Bond actually uses the word kinky in this movie, I, I kind of find it's, like, kind of weird. Um, so I think there was sort of, like, a weird attempt. And, and, and I'm not even even getting near yet the whole scene where he's literally shagging Maude Adams with Good night uh, with the closet. I mean, that's, that's kind of borderline. Like that's pretty, I think I would call that pretty racy for, especially for the time and for a, you know, a humble little PG bond movie. Another thing I think the film has in its favor, a lot of times, and I mean, I know I said this during you only live twice. Sometimes when they do the Asian yeah. locations, I, I kind of feel like a little disconnect. Like it's it's not something. It, it's almost too exotic for me. I, I find that this one it, it it's enjoying its location yes. a little more. I think uh, there's a lot more scenes where you're seeing like like dancing and 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 things and the, the and restaurants and just beautiful locations. Um, so it seems to sort of take a little more. You know, has a little more fun with its location. Uh, for my money, I could just be totally wrong, and it could be just a sort of a weird preference. But I kind of felt like the look of the film was good, and the gambling that that yeah. funky gambling scene where they're, she's doing the, the the they're doing the pass with the with the bullets in the cigarette case. But that first part but makes just, really has some really good narrative sense too going on. So let's talk about the story a little bit, because honestly, again, I think we've sort of decided that this is kind of like. It's kind of the MacGuffin story, not exactly, because I think like for your eyes only, uh, from Russia with love, that's a little more of a MacGuffin story because the story, the thrust of the story, really is to find that thing. Here it is, kind of an afterthought. That whole Solax agitator. If, if you took that out, not much is changing. So it's like I, I really can't even exactly call it a MacGuffin because it's not driving the story. It it's just sort of like again, I think it like we said, somebody later on just realized the story doesn't really reach heights, you know? And by, Oh, by the way, one of the things I did notice, or I've always sort of noticed about this film when he's in M's office and he's kind of getting the mission and, and talking about Scaramanga bond talks about the energy crisis. The energy crisis is still with us. I kind of feel like that's, that's probably the first time in, in, any Bond movie that they really tried to get sort of topical because that was, you know, I mean, again, seriously, I remember the oil crisis, gas lines. Like I, rem- I remember getting woken up by my mother. We got packed in a car so she could just go and sit online at the gas station for 
hours. I, I look back and I can never understand why did we have lines for gas? If there was a shortage, it didn't mean that the actual pump pumped things slower. So why why were we sitting on line waiting to get gas? But I, whatever. Uh, so but anyway, so here here it mentions it in the film, and it's interesting because again, like you, it's again looking back, you sort of go, oh yeah, there was a, that was a thing back then. It's weird. This is a film no. that's not talked about um, all that much, but there's things like that and the Golden Gun that are kind of you know always brought up and quite a mm. bit. Well, yeah, yeah, and that goes to what we've said before about every even like the. The, you know, even your least favorite Bond movie is going to have things yeah. in it that are pretty iconic that you, that you like. And, and yeah, this one, same thing. I, I, there's things in it that are great. But, yeah, I again, I, I almost find that this one is it's so hidden that it's it's just kind of right there in the <laughs> right, middle. Right. You know, like, I mean, I, 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 I don't really have – there's nothing about this film I really love. And there's nothing in it that I really complain about too loud. Yeah. it's It just flies under the radar, yeah. just like Bond's plane. <laughs> and, wow. I, I don't know. We should just end it right there. <laughs> I think some of the action scenes are rather unremarkable. Like the Kung Fu isn't particularly good. Um, and it's a little, the direction's a little lethargic in my opinion and those scenes. Um, mm. Although there is a funny moment, you know, where they, he goes to bow and he kicks the guy right away. That's a funny moment. It, it's right. I'm, But again, like you said, I mean, they're not playing it for action. They're just doing it for, yeah, yeah. rather do a chuckle. I, yeah, yeah, this one and, really and yeah, goes seriously, I mean, and this in the action sequences for sure. Like yeah. Even like that, that amazing jump, yeah. that spiral jump, which, you know, it was, um, you know, they did it on a computer, you know, they worked out the math on that. And it was like, you know, they got this car, a special car, yeah. and they put a special thing in the car so it could make the jump and everything. And it's, you know. All kind of ruined. <laughs> and there's nothing because I think. Yeah. Well, you know, I've always, I complained before about the John ba- that John Barry little cue there. My the only time he made a misstep, as far as I'm concerned, in the series. But um, you know, <laughs> yeah. he was kind of going with the flow of the the scene though. You got Sheriff J W Pepper. Let's go get him, boy, and all that stuff. Yeah. So he's kind of he's right, kind of right. playing he's playing well, the it, right. scene and, and, the way you know, the tone of it. You know. Yes, and and frankly, all, the films in general were starting yeah. to get that tone. Uh, I mean, this is kind of the precursor to the double taking pigeons. I think that the dialogue in this film is really good. I, the, 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 in fact, I, I'll even, I'll even say that the only thing I kind of don't like about that lunch scene is I sort of feel like there's a little too many times when Bond tries to get a dig, you know what I mean? And it's almost like it's like kind of punchline, punchline, punchline. Not, not even like ha ha punchlines, but just little digs, and it sort of derails the conversation, which I'm actually sort of finding interesting. I like the dialogue in the film, the innuendos are getting kind of masterful in this one, I find. I, I There's a lot, there's a lot of, like, you're getting into full-blown double entendres, the, the Roger Moore double entendres, but they're not getting overly silly yet. They, they're still sort of working on a level where if you're a kid watching the film, it might just pass right by you. You know, it's not like on the nose, like some of the Brosnan stuff. I see you handle your weapon well. I have been known to keep my tip up. It's it's not even like those they're not even innuendos anymore. It's just like he's saying penis, penis, penis. One of the more interesting aspects of the man with the golden gun is the lost sequence. What is that lost sequence you say? I'm glad you asked. It's actually the duel between Scaramanga and Bond on the island near the end. Uh, as it plays out now in the film, Nick Nack counts down from ten. Uh, when he reaches zero, Bond turns, fires the gun. Scaramanga is not there. Now, originally, it was going to go down differently. What they had was they did the same thing, the same setup. Nick Nack was counting down. Bond turns, and Scaramanga is not there. But Bond then runs for cover. And then there's a little bit of a vocal exchange between the two, which you can see in the teaser trailer for the film. So we kind of establish a little bit of a cheat here with Scaramanga, that he's not on the up and up, and uh, maybe he's not as good as we're led to believe. I understand why they might have cut the sequence. It might be because of that reason. Um, it might have lowered the stakes a little bit, 
made Skyrim manga seem more, uh, I wouldn't say petty, but it made him seem maybe a little weaker, you know, like he's a little bit more of a, I don't know, a cheater. I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense or, you know, it, for whatever reason, they cut the sequence. What is also interesting about this, this cut lost footage is that uh, initially Q gave uh, Bon a gadget. It was a 35 millimeter camera that had, uh, I think, explosive tear gas um, and it also shot a, a projectile out of it uh, that was an, it had an explosive head, I think. And uh, the only thing it didn't do was take pictures, which Bond sort of busted Q about. And he also had, with this camera, was an explosive thermos. Now, if you watch the teaser trailer, you can see um, this thermos. Bond throws it in the air and then goes to shoot it, I guess, to make it explode near Scaramanga. In the trailer, though, they, they show him throwing the thermos. He shoots... And then they cut to the scene earlier in the, in the film of the plane exploding. But, you know, in the trailer, you have no idea. You just think, wow, oh, something exploded. Pretty cool. It's one of the, I think it's, for me, it's one of the more fascinating lost sequences. I'd really like to see it someday. Maybe not so much put back into the movie, um, although that would be fascinating. But to maybe see it reassembled, like some kind of three-minute sequence, like maybe when the um, inevitable 4K uh, UHD uh, Blu-rays pop up, maybe we'll get that sequence. I don't know if the footage is gone, it's lost, um, and I, you know, I don't have any insider information, but it's something I would love to see. If I had a vote for one sequence I'd like to see that was cut from a Bond film, it would be that one. And by the way, who joins in the boat chase? God damn! Little brown water hog! Oh, what's the matter, J.W. Hub? You just try that in my bayou, boy! I'd hold your ass! Yeah, because that's exactly where he would go. I, I... If you got your little pointy heads out of them pajamas, you wouldn't be late for work. When he pops up in this, it's I, I will say that they use him effectively because it's interesting that he shows up kind of briefly during the boat chase. And then he goes away, and then later on he shows up again for the car chase. Uh, now again, how about demonstration, boy? Certainly, sir. I, I mean, again, should he should he be in here at all? Uh, I would say no. But if you if you if you insist on putting him in here, I do think they use him reasonably well. My overall score of the film. Uh, I'm almost tempted to go a little higher because I because I have I have to admit I do kind of have a nostalgic pull with this one. It's one I recorded off television, you know, even in the days before VHS, um, which basically I just took a little cassette recorder, put it to the TV speaker, hit record, <laughs> and I had you know the audio for Man with the Golden Gun, uh, and I used to listen to that before going to sleep for many years. So I kind of have a lot of this movie memorized. <laughs> Um, sort of all the useless information in this noggin here. Part of that is Man with the Golden Gun. Uh, but I do see its shortcomings. Um, uh, I have to give it a seven, though, because it's it, it, it's a good film. I like it more than maybe most fans, but I do recognize that there it's not up to, like, you know, an eight or above. It's not um, It's not a great James Bond film. There's a lot of parts I like. I like um, the, uh, you know, I like the Scaramanga Funhouse. Although I wish the Funhouse would have been more elaborate and maybe a little bit longer, and especially in the climax. Um, I really like um, him uh, at the beginning being a marked guy and kind of trying to hunt Scaramanga down. Uh, I like the the sequence with Lazar, the gunmaker. And the speak now, forever hold your peace. <laughs> it's great stuff. Um, I even like that uh, sequence with Saida uh, in her dressing room. And that fight sequence is pretty good. It's a little reminiscent. It's not as good as, don't get me wrong, it's not as good as some of the Connery fights or most of the Connery fights. But it does, uh, it's actually pretty good you know, for the more era fighting. Um, even, even with that mirror swinging in, you can see that camera crew for an instant. Uh, it's got some really neat stuff. Um, and I have a I have a soft spot for Mary Goodnight. I really do. Um, I don't ask me why. I once in a while I like a ditz. You know, I like a little bit of a klutz. And uh, she plays it to the point where it's not like 
so eye rolling. Some might disagree, but um, I really think she's uh, she's kind of perfect in that role. And I think Maude Adams gives a great performance. That's another great sequence. The sequence with um, him and Maude Adams and, and her coming out of the shower and a water pistol. <laughs> It's a great line. And uh, one of the things I like about these early Bond films with Moore is his unpredictability. Um, I just totally don't... I mean, it's, it's almost shocking to see him go to those lengths with Maude Adams in that sequence. But you also have to remember, you know, he's at that point, he thinks he's a marked man. So, yeah, he's, he's playing for keeps, and he's not fooling around. So I really like that. Um, the Later in the film, the... Uh, the scenes with Christopher Lee and Moore are great. I think both those guys play those scenes brilliantly. They do a great job. Um, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, this movie is fun. Um, and uh, I actually like it more than some of the latter day Bond films. So there you go. Uh, I'm giving it a five. Because like I said, it's, it's, it's literally just kind of like, flatline it it's uh, there's not a lot that i love about it there's not a lot that i hate about it it's it's not that i have big problems with it but i you know never think to put it on and watch it despite the fact that it's like probably the least watched film in my collection in, in the bond collection you would think like oh let me watch this one because at least it'll feel a little new when i see it nah, it just it just never never occurs to me to watch this one so like I said, it's it's just totally flatline. Giving it a five. Hmm. The worst part of the man with the golden gun. The worst aspect. Foo yuck. It'd probably be J.W. Pepper. I'm going to say this. He's vacationing in Thailand, which is ridiculous. This guy is not going to Thailand. It's just, all right? <laughs> it's just not this guy's M.O. But, okay, so he's there. I don't mind a, that little cameo, maybe. And him getting, you know, pushed into the water by the elephant. Okay. But to have him involved in a major chase sequence? Uh, oh. Yeah, that's not good. Because I think it, it ruins the tone of that whole sequence. And it takes away from that spiral jump, which is so spectacular and so meticulously planned. It's really kind of a shame that uh, it's played for laughs. Because it really takes the the air out of the scene you know because that's supposed to be a uh, heart in your moment uh, a heart in your throat moment rather and yeah they you know barry does a slide whistle which is his one misstep his one misstep in the whole entire series and even he's admitted that um but <laughs> it is what it is and there's no going back so it, it you know but, uh, yeah, that's probably my least favorite aspect. Other than that, I kind of really like The Man with the Golden Gun. It's it's a good Bond film. Not a great Bond film, but it's a pretty good one. My least favorite thing, and this is kind of low-hanging fruit, I, I agree with you about the action scenes. Just I, it, It's sort of odd that they would have followed Live and Let Die that had a great boat chase that, that really did as much as it could with a boat chase in the bayou. And here they do a littler boat chase with not much at all. So it's, it's odd that they even sort of went there. Um, but at, at the risk of appearing to just swing at low hanging fruit, it's JW Pepper. Like, why is he here? I mean, again, he's funny in the, in the other one. I get it. And so they wanted to bring him back. But really, like in Thailand, I haven't even gone to Thailand. You know, like it's it's a it's a. But but yeah, he would go there. That makes a lot of sense. So yeah, I mean, again, I don't hate it. It's good for a couple of chuckles, but it's just so like so fourth wall breaking. It's just ridiculous. Ooh, my favorite part of the man with the golden gun. The best part. I, I it's I, you know I gotta take Christopher Lee. Christopher Lee is the man. Uh, Christopher Lee is just a, a terrific actor, um, and he plays Scaramanga brilliantly. Uh, originally, they wanted Jack Palance for the part. He passed, and when they got Christopher Lee, they sort of rewrote the screenplay to sort of fit Lee's uh, persona. And I think he does this marvelously. Uh, he's a great villain um, to go uh, head-to-head -head with James Bond. 
Um, I love the golden gun and the way it, uh, it, it can be assembled and disassembled. Uh, I even like, you know, Knickknack as his personal servant there. I just think it's really cool. Uh, yeah. So Christopher Lee and Christopher Lee just, I, I think he brings this movie up a few levels because for me, the one thing that does it, you know, if Live and Let Die was supposed to be a black exploitation, this was sort of supposed to be Bond mixed with the little Kung Fu genre thing going on, martial arts genre. Um, and that's an aspect of this film that doesn't work because the martial arts is not very good and kind of clunky and mostly played for laughs. So, yeah, that's one aspect of the film that doesn't work and it kind of does take it down a few notches for me. Um, but Christopher Lee, you know, he's, hold, he's the glue that holds this together. And uh, looking at Brett Eklund and Maude Adams ain't so bad either. I, you already grabbed it with Christopher Lee. I mean, he's he's got to be again one of the, one of the Bond villains of the ages. He's spectacular in this. Um, so I think I might just give it to. I'm gonna give it to the actual Golden Gun, and I kind of feel like that's even not that. That's kind of a lame one, but. I think the gimmick is clever, and I think for the time it was probably pretty ingenious, and you probably hadn't nobody thought of that before. Uh, so yeah, I'll give it to that. It's sort of a, as far as iconic props go, that's definitely one for the ages. So I hope you enjoyed this review of the Man with the Golden Gun. Thank you as always, Scott. By the way, if this one felt a little hodgepodge, a little wonky, and a little late, uh, sorry about that. But we did have some technical issues this week. Uh, we lost some footage, and I my laptop blew up. I had a whole new system to set up, uh, and then I was also on vacation last week, so we I couldn't even get back to my studio to fix and correct a few things. So, but here you go, and it, I kind of think it happened sort of for the best because uh, Scott was able to reshoot a few things, take his time, as you could probably tell, and uh, talk about a couple things that we actually didn't get to the first time we tried to record. So, anyway, there you go. Well, I hope you enjoyed this one, and now Scott and I can get busy working on The Spy Who Loved Me. So, as always, the Bean James Bond reviews will return the countdown to Bond 25. See you next week. James Bond. James Bond.